episode two of the Books and Booze book reviews foray into YouTube. Um, I'm cold today. I got my flannel on. I got my Western jacket on. Got my winter hat on. So I'm cold. Um, but I'm going to be reviewing one of the more incredulous, unique, and extraordinary books, novels that I've ever read, which is Joris Carl Wiesmann's Against Nature. And I love, absolutely love the cover of this book, which is a painting called The Yellow Scale, self-portrait by Kupka. And it just is one of those covers that perfectly encapsulates the personality and ethos of the book. I'll probably get into, more, into that more later, but it's just awesome. I kind of want to print out this painting, actually. Um, so there's so much history behind this book and so little plot, and it's such a unique book that I could not decide. I've been mulling over how I want to review this book and, it, and in what order. I think I decided that I'm going to be doing the history first, talk about Wiesmann a little bit, then I'll get into the plot and writing style, and I'll tell you my final thoughts at the end. So Wiesmann was a writer in 18th century France who was a prominent writer in the naturalist movement, with, uh, which was spearheaded by Zola. If you're unfamiliar with naturalism, it was kind of a 18th century knee-jerk reaction to the Romanticism movement. And uh, it was it's basically a mashup of literary realism, um, objectivism, and philosophical materialism, which is, in short, stating that matter is the only and ultimate reality that if you cannot see it or feel it, it doesn't exist and it doesn't matter um so Wiesmann wrote about he wrote naturalist novels for a long time but he ultimately decided that it was kind of a dead end movement and it was kind of treading water and there's no grand conclusion of it and so he eventually rejected the entire movement rejected his friends within the movement and he wrote against nature kind of hitting the nail on the head with the title there um and more importantly before i move on from talking about the naturalist movement is they wrote very um they had meticulous attention to detail they wrote about lower class citizens and about the livelihoods of lower class citizens and more importantly is what they wrote without there was no high drama there was no symbolism in the naturalist writings there was no indulgence there was no fantasies or something like that um and after reading this book, you see that Huisman was the total opposite of that. And in my opinion, he wrote this book. The purpose of writing this book is to reject the naturalist movement and to spearhead a the decadent and symbolist movement. Um, <clears throat> so that's the history behind it. Huisman, I found out about Huisman by reading Welbeck's submission, where the protagonist is a scholar at some university, and he, he studies and did all of his PhD work on Huisman. So it kind of got my interest going. I did some research and eventually read this and three other books he read. Um, but today I'm just going to be reviewing this one. So the plot, um, the, the protagonist is this man named Deasant. I think that's how you pronounce it. It's D-E-S-E-S-S-E-I-N-T-E-S. -S -E -S -S -E -S. I know you don't care how it's spelled. But it's about Deasant, who's kind of the last in line of a line of French aristocrats who, as time goes on, their health has been slowly deteriorating. So he's presented as this sickly frail uh french dandy who we shortly find out is sick of contemporary life in france um there's a great sentence that i'm going to read that basically sums up his attitude already he was dreaming of a refined solitude a comfortable desert a motionless ark in which to seek refuge from the unending deluge of human stupidity um so that basically sums up half of the decade of movement itself itself which is defined by um disgust at contemporary society. When I read this sentence, um, it reminded me of my old favorite book when I was a young man, which is Henry David Thoreau's Walden Pond. If you've never read that or you're unfamiliar, um, it's about Thoreau goes in the woods, lives in a cabin alone, and discovers that the best way to live life is to live simply, embracing nature, go on walk in nature, to kind of harmonize um, human life and nature itself. So when I read this, I was like, oh, so Huisman and Thoreau are kind of at the same starting point where they decide that Contemporary society is corrupt and disgusting, and they're done with it. I soon find out that basically their conclusion, uh, after starting at that same starting point, could not be further apart. Um, I'm going to read this next passage here. Um, the secret lies in knowing how to proceed, how to concentrate deeply enough to produce the hallucination, and succeed in substituting the dream reality for the reality itself. Artifice, besides, seemed to Deasant the final distinctive mark of man's genius. Nature had had her day. Really, what dullness. 
There's not one of her inventions, no matter how subtle or imposing it may be, which human genius cannot create. So while Thoreau embraced nature and seek to harmonize um, humans and nature, um, Wiesmann seek to shun nature and to embrace artifice. So that's pretty much the decadent movement, which is forgoing ethics, forgoing responsibilities, and embracing hedonism, things that appeal to the senses. Fine wines, drugs, lots of sex, uh, huge uh, pieces of art. And uh, that's what De Assant seeks to do, is to go away from society, go live alone, and indulge in the senses. And how does he plan on doing that? He has a big family mansion in the French countryside where he goes, and his plan is to customize every square inch of the house and every room in the house according to his taste. And De Assant is a very erudite man. He knows, has like a fountain of knowledge about art and history and vocabulary, the language with which he writes, and of course, the language with which Wiesmann writes. is it's, it's like saccharine, it's beautiful, artistic. He has, I mean, you gotta have a dictionary ready if you're gonna be reading this one. I learned like 50 words reading this book, uh, in a good way, of course, I think. But he's a very knowledgeable guy. And there's so many scenes <laughs> that are like ridiculous that put on display his penchant for indulgence. And I'm gonna read one of them here. This is when De Assant decides that his days as a strong, virile man are over. He's kind of giving in to his sickly health and he puts on this dinner kind of performance um, as a funeral for his virility. It's kind of long, but bear with me in this. <laughs> There's a lot of passages like this. The dining room draped in black opened out to a garden metamorphosed for the occasion. The paths being strewn with charcoal, the ornamental pond edged with black basalt and filled with ink, and the shrubberies replanted with cypresses and pines. The dinner itself was served on a black cloth, adorned with baskets of violets and scabious. Candelabra shed an eerie green light over the table and tapers flickered in the chandeliers. While a hidden orchestra played funeral marches, <laughs> the guests were waited on by naked black women, naked black women, wearing only slippers and stockings and cloth of silver embroidered with tears. Dining off black bordered plates, the company had enjoyed turtle soup, Russian rye bread, ripe olives from Turkey, caviar, mullet botargo, black puddings from Frankfurt, game served in sauces of the color of licorice and boot polish, truffle jellies, chocolate creams, plum puddings, nectarines, pears and grape juice syrup, mulberries and black heart cherries. From dark tinted glasses, they had drunk the wines of Le Mans and Roussillon, of Tenedos, Valdepeñas, and Oporto. And after coffee and walnut cordial, they had rounded off the evening with porter and stout. This dinner was described as a funeral banquet in memory of the host's virility, lately but only temporarily deceased. Um, this reminds me to present the drink that I'm pairing this with, which is a Russian, uh, sorry, French drink called Kir, K-A-R-K-I-R, which is a black currant liqueur, and then you pour uh, French white wine into it. It's apparently pretty popular in France. I've never heard of this, but more importantly, I wanted to show the uh, my picked out my most ornate, sensational <laughs> glass I could find, which still isn't that crazy. But I think it uh, after that passage, you get a sense for Wiesmann and Deassan's flair for the dramatic, the high artiste. So it seems only right to be drinking out of such a chalice. Um, but after that passage, you kind of get this, this sense that Huy's mom wants to present De Assant as a man of <laughs> very melodramatic, uh, wants to dye the pond black. All the food is black. The waitresses are naked and they're black and everything is black. They're drinking from tinted uh, glasses. And so he wants to take this ethos and translate it to every room in his house not necessarily black but just going over the top of decorating it and off the top of my mind i remember he has a room dedicated to scents only so he has all the perfumes he can find from the finest perfumer in france and one perfume for each little mood and occasion he could think of i can kind of relate to that because i like colognes and perfumes he has a room that's basically a bar where he's collected all the wines all the bourbons all the liquors all the beers from all over the world. He has them all on tap, so whatever mood he's in, he can go in there. He has an art room for art that he likes. He has an art room for art, which brings about feelings of misery and pain. He has paintings of tortures and uh, uh, very scenic 
crucifix painting. Um, and this also allows Huisman to convey his taste. And he's basically using De Sant as a vessel for his own taste and his own disgust towards um, French life, of course. But you're probably wondering, I mean, this book, it's not super long, but it's, it's about 230 pages. And that's the entirety of the plot is what I just said. He goes and lives in this house and customizes it himself. So if you're looking for a plot, if you're looking for a journey or a saga, not the book for you. But Huisman fills up 230 plus pages of these vivid descriptions. It's basically the whole book. Um, and so it, and, and that way, it's kind of hard to get through. It took me two weeks to read this book. It's only 230 pages. I can usually read that in about a week. But it's not because it's emotionally moving or anything like that. It's just such rich saccharine writing that you read a passage, you're like, oh my God, I got to read this again. I got to read it again. For that reason, I say it's it's a very unique book. Um, it's also unique in that there's no plot. That's why I said at the beginning, a novel. How can you really call this a novel when nothing happens? But uh, if you're into this beautiful writing, I think it's funny. I laugh so much during this book at how over the top uh, De Asant is as a character. I'm very into that kind of stuff. Um, I want to revisit the cover here. This is basically what I imagine De Asant to look like. Look at him smoking a cigarette, reading a book that he likes, that he thinks French society probably opposes. He's laid back. He doesn't care. If I hold close enough, you can see this green painting around his head, which kind of like, he's sickly. Like I said, De Asant is sickly. He doesn't really care about his health. He's smoking cigarettes, drinking, doing drugs. He's not going outside, that's for sure. Um, and I read a bunch of good review, Goodreads reviews, and one of the ones I saw the most that people liked was this scene where De Assant decides that his room, he this is after he's done decorating his house, he decides that it's just this, that he needs something shiny to walk around. He needs a glint in the corner to catch his eye. So he gets a pet turtle and he brings it to this jeweler in, in uh, France. And he tells him that he wants to encase the turtle in gold and inside the gold, he wants all of the jewels in the world to surround him. <laughs> this is like ridiculous. And the jeweler does it, he gets a turtle, and of course the turtle dies because he's walking around with an <laughs> enormous overweight shell on his back. But there's so many passages like that where it's just this ridiculous over-the-top character. And in the end, it serves to reject the naturalist movement, um, to spearhead the decadent movement, which I love. I love the decadent books. I love Baudelaire. I love Jean Laurent. I love these extravagant characters. And uh, if there's no plot, that's fine with me. I give this 4.1 out of 5. I don't want to give it 5 because you have to have something going on, I think, if you want the 5. If you want the 4.5, there has to be more of a plot, um, especially with today's readers. I don't imagine this being very popular with today's readers who are so plot-driven. And I've never even heard of this guy until I read Welbeck. I don't think he's very famous at all in the Americas, but in Europe, I, I think he's pretty famous. So... That's my, that's my review of Against Nature. I loved it. Awesome writing, no plot. Um, this is actually, you've probably heard of this book, uh, The Picture of Dorian Gray, um, which very heavily alludes to this book. So I think next episode I'm, I'm going to be doing Dorian Gray, which is my favorite book of all time. And one of the characters in that book is very deeply moved by the decadence of De Assant and Joris Carl Wiesmann's Against Nature. So thanks for listening. Next episode, a picture of Dorian Gray, a tune for your time.